Until relatively recently, it was believed that the proton was one of the most well-studied and well-understood particles. But it later turned out that, in reality, this particle is quite different from what we thought about it. Moreover, the ideas that existed 20 or 30 years ago are now considered, well, not exactly laughable, but certainly not accurate. And in the course of studying it, it turned out that the proton has a bunch of different features that don't match what we expected from it. The proton has so-called crises or paradoxes. For example, there's the proton radius crisis, which indicates that, in fact, the proton's radius does not match what was expected, or the proton mass crisis, where it turns out that the known components should only contribute about 3% to the proton's mass. There's also the problem of the proton's composition, which shows that the proton's makeup is different from what we're used to seeing in classic diagrams. And perhaps the most interesting thing is that, by and large, the proton is also not eternal and is also subject to decay. After all, for a long time it was believed that the proton was the most thoroughly studied particle. We have discovered that the proton has so-called non-standard or exotic states. These exotic states are interesting because, by and large, they have the potential to further upend our understanding of this fascinating, supposedly stable and supposedly well-studied particle. These ideas allow us to gain a deeper understanding of the forces that operate at the level of the strong interaction. After all, exotic states are also protons, but protons that differ in composition and, of course, in their properties. Don't change the channel, as they used to say. Even better, subscribe right away and watch the video until the end. And today, we will learn even more about the mysteries of the proton. I'm sure it will be interesting. If you look at any diagram depicting a proton, where you see these two little balls, these are the up quarks and down quarks, this is the standard diagram, which I'll show on the screen now you'll notice that the structure of the proton has a certain characteristic and standard configuration, a standard arrangement that we expect to see. This is determined by the fact that quarks, roughly speaking, interact with each other in exactly this ratio. And for a long time, it was assumed that the composition of the proton would be exactly like this. Why is that? Because quarks can combine only in these specific ratios and in these specific quantities. It turned out that this stable state of the proton, which has been well studied, this state that we see in the diagram, can actually be different, and it can differ under special conditions. Moreover, some non-standard states can exist for quite a long time, although all of them, by and large, remain unstable. And these states differ from the scheme we saw on the screen just a few seconds ago in that their composition will be different. And now, as you sit here watching this video, maybe just for fun, maybe you're drinking tea and turned it on just to have it talking in the background. But one way or another, for scientists, this was a real shock. For a long time, it was assumed that quarks could only combine in certain standard ways. That's how we got the picture for the proton, the neutron, and other particles where we saw quarks. But it turned out that quarks can also combine in the strangest ways. When such a combination occurred, we would say that a new so-called exotic state had formed. And once again, let's clarify that an exotic state of the proton is still the same proton, but with a different number of quarks inside it. So it turns out that we can actually talk about entirely new unexplored particles. And yes, there can be different numbers of quarks, and there can also be a different state of gluons, which for some reason, in certain cases, begin to exhibit active properties inside the proton. Although, let me remind you that gluons are precisely those particles that, essentially, are supposed to bind all the other particles together. These are the particles responsible for the strong interaction. But in one of the exotic states, they display their own properties and do so very actively and powerfully. For a long time, exotic states were described only as something found on the pages of books and as something that existed merely at the level of hypothesis. And just imagine the scientists' surprise when it turned out that these exotic states began to be discovered. Exotic states are interesting because they are not always stable. In fact, they are almost never stable. But at the same time, they are balanced enough, sufficiently stabilized, so that they can be detected and isolated under laboratory conditions. In real life, you might ask, do such states exist or not? In the surrounding reality, such states may be present, but you are more likely to expect to see them where there are various complex processes. Some kind of star collisions, or, let's call them, cosmic disturbances. And when different processes occur that are associated with the appearance of new particles or something like that, you can expect to see exotic states as well. But all of this is great. So what exotic states do protons have? Logically, it has been possible to identify or somehow systematize a general picture of about three standard exotic states. Why about? 
Because in fact, right now we can say that there are three of these exotic states. At the moment we might assume that we know perfectly well how a proton will behave in the presence of elliptical states. But later it may turn out to be the same as what we currently observe with an ordinary proton. It will turn out to be unstable. It will turn out that it has a different radius, and many other things will turn out to be different as well. But at least for now we can confidently talk about the three most well-known states. These are the tetraquark, the pentaquark, and the hybrid state of the proton. Tetraquark, well, the name is probably self-explanatory. Let me remind you that all these things like tetrahexane and these prefixes like tetra, penta, and so on, these are names that indicate quantity. And since you've already heard that the exotic state of the proton is distinguished by the addition of a new quark composition, it's not hard to guess that a tetraquark is a state of the proton where one more quark has been added, making it four quarks instead of the expected three. A pentaquark is a state of the proton where there are five quarks instead of the expected three. And a hybrid state is a state where gluons begin to exhibit their properties as independent particles. These particular states are profoundly interesting and hold significant importance for both the scientific community and for us as observers. This is primarily because, in essence, we are able to meticulously observe a truly peculiar and unexpected kind of strange behavior manifesting within a particle that is otherwise extensively well-known and thoroughly well-described in the established frameworks of physics. These unclear entities that are formed, which we have even managed to systematize, the so-called exotic states, imply an incomplete understanding of the strong interaction. So how do these exotic states come about? As a rule, these are the very experiments you've already heard about many times. These are experiments related to the collider. What is done in a collider? In a collider, well, it's probably no surprise that particles collide, and through this strange process, either various new particles are knocked out, or a huge amount of energy is released, or something along those lines happens. There are many things we could list here, but for us right now, something else is important. What matters is that when we see standard particles being formed, there's nothing new about that. But when we see that there is some interaction we've described, there are certain expected characteristics, and then there's the actual result, which differs from all of that. We need to ask ourselves, do we really understand, for example, the strong interaction itself? Why does it happen that at some moment, whether it's for a few seconds or a few hours, it doesn't matter how long, the strong interaction behaves differently than we expected? And this is the key idea. It is very likely that all the types of interactions we distinguish either differ from what we describe, or they work differently, or perhaps there is an entirely different kind of interaction altogether. 